Aloha. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Tur Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a bi-weekly interview program featuring the lives of immigrants and descendants of immigrants, cultural diversity, and their contribution to American experiment. Today's guest is Professor Tom Rose, creative artist and professor of art. Welcome, Professor. Professor Rose, can you hear us? Thank you. Yes. Well, yes. Well, welcome uh, to the show. Uh, we are... Thank you very much, and I appreciate your uh, uh, invite. It's our honor and pleasure to have you on the show. Inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you um, very much. So, oh, yeah, I'm going to. Yes, yeah, so we are starting, and I'm going to uh, read you a short bio to our audience, and then I have some questions for you, Professor. So okay. you. Re you received your BFA from the University of Illinois Champaign. And by pure serendipity, that's where I get my Master of Arts in Art History. So we are, uh, we have some you know, fellow Illini. Fellow so, Illini. Exactly. Fighting Illini. Yes. And you received your uh, MA from uh, UC Berkeley, and you also studied at Long University in Sweden. And you are a very accomplished artist, and you uh, have been a professor of art at the University of Minnesota Department of Art for many, many years. And you are well known for your innovative contribution to contemporary art. With a passion for creativity and unique artistic vision, Professor Rose's art explores themes of identity, memory and human condition. Some of Professor Rose's artwork are thought-provoking, spanning from painting, sculpture, and installation art, captivate audience with the conceptual depth and ecstatic appeal. Along with your artistic practice, Professor Rose is an art educator and made a significant impact to the younger generation of aspiring artist. And you have, your achievement have garnered recognition and you have exhibited your artworks across the world. Some of your artwork have been uh, permanently collected by galleries and museums in New York, Minnesota, and China. And as we are, part, again, we are very honored to have you on the show. And let's go straight to questions. And because you, uh, in uh, in our correspondence, you you mentioned that you are third generation Irish English American, and uh, do you know how your ancestors uh, came to settle in the United States? Yes, yes, that's correct. And uh, um, I could start. I could read you a little bit of a, a text here. My grandfather uh, uh, wrote a memoirs back in about 1932, 33. He died in 1936. And he starts this with, I do not quite know why I'm writing this, certainly not from vainglory. I have little cause for that. Perhaps it is because my boys, my father and my uncle, have indicated that they might read it. Perhaps because I want them to know what their father did before, uh, before them. Whatever the reason, I shall try to set down as truthfully as I may be uh, in these lines that follow what little I know of my forebears and the story of my life. And there's one other little section I would like to read. Mm -hmm. From this, uh, my father's name was James Moore Rose and my mother's Agnes Leslie, both my father and my mother were descendants of ancestry, which so which go uh, which so far as I can learn, seldom rose above or descended below the level of respectability. But some of them were titled, some were farmers or tradespeople, and practically and probably some of them not much of anything. 
A few were hanged, one was beheaded, but for no more reason <clears throat> or crime than I have been told, then they belong to the wrong political party, failing to keep still about it. Well, uh, my um, grandfather uh, was uh, a uh, well second generation uh, immigrant from Ireland. His parents uh, came from both Scotland and uh, and or, I mean, excuse me, from Ireland and um, uh, and uh, and England. The mixture between Scottish uh, word for rose. Uh, could translate or often used as ruse or a ruse or a Ross, etc. But the main one is essentially Rose. Uh, mm -hmm. He goes on to describe how or when they came to the United States in about 19, or excuse me, in about 1840, give or take, uh, you know, sort of a number of years. But anyway, certainly the Irish potato famine in 19, 1847 uh, was a critical point in which many came to the United States. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, came as a single person in about uh, about then, about 20, about 1840, mid mid 1840s, landed in New York, uh, and uh, he actually then uh, landed in Brooklyn. And after being there for a while, established a stone carving uh, operation. He had been trained mm -hmm. as a stone cutter in Ireland as a uh, indentured, well, essentially as a a trainee, and at that time. Uh, the idea was that you gave your son or whatever to the uh, to the uh, to the master, and uh, the, he was apparently uh, at that time uh, 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 apprentices were not very well treated, much as though they were slaves, and uh, a little bit of money went to the father, and not anything much to the son, other than room and board, which was meager at the time. Anyway, he. Uh, took off and uh, jumped a ship and came to the United States, landing in New York, as I mentioned. Uh, once he was here, uh, he took his trade to the streets. And at the time, New York was uh, in the process of building a wide variety of, uh, of uh, 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 constructions uh, of, uh, of row houses, and many of them uh, requiring things like uh, mantelpieces, et cetera, et cetera all hand carved stone. So he established a business, a trade, uh, uh, and had a stone cutting uh, firm uh, that was located at 33rd and 5th Avenue in New York, about mm -hmm. where Macy's is now. And mm -hmm. that lasted uh, up until the, uh, uh, just prior to the Civil War. Uh, he had a partner, my grandfather or great grandfather, excuse me, went off to uh, to uh, uh, at that time Ohio to start uh, uh, essentially to expand the business, and that was when the war broke out. The Civil War broke out, and so in uh, when he returned after uh, sort of was able to do it, his partner had run off with everything. And so there was little left of the stone carving business. And uh, so then he moved to Chicago. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's essentially the background. I see. And his training as a uh, as a stone cutter, stone mason, uh, was then translated to my grandfather uh, at uh, the age of about um, 18 or something, right in about there, uh, in Chicago, who went to work as an intern or as a uh, apprentice to an architect named J.J. Egan, who did a lot of work uh, in and around the Chicago area. They didn't do any of the large uh, skyscrapers that were going up, but my grandfather then worked with them on a number of uh, of of, of uh, in particular churches and so on, doing a lot of stone carving. He was extremely good at it and was uh, well appreciated. He did manage to do a lot of the work for the Irish Industries Building uh, for the Chicago Exhibition, or, you know, the, the, essentially for the White City uh, that occurred in 1884. And uh, so right about that time, uh, he uh, established his own uh, business, moving to Milwaukee, hmm. uh, and worked with a partner uh, named Charles Kirchhoff. 
Now, he had a couple of partners before that or a couple of people that he worked with before that. But Kirchhoff uh, had uh, had an established name in the city. And uh, so they had a, a, a good roster of clients. Um, and then uh, around the turn of the century, 1900, uh, my uh, uh, partner, my grandfather and his partner were uh, very active uh, in the area. They did a lot of work for the for the Keith Orpheum um, to uh, design uh, vaudeville theaters around the country. Uh, two of them here, or one of them here in Minneapolis, the Orpheum Theater in New York. There oh, was yeah. the the uh, the uh, the uh, Palace Theater on, you know, sort of Broadway. And uh, in Chicago, there were several, there were several in Milwaukee, Riverside, and so on. But he also did a number of uh, projects for a family or for the uh, uh, the Schlitz Brewery, uh, as well as for the Eline family, uh, the owners then of Schlitz Brewery. Mm-hmm. And so there's, those things are still uh, available, still visible. Uh, one of the projects I did uh, sort of creatively uh, after reading this long um, uh, memoir, I decided at one point that I really wanted to do something about it or with it, use it as some kind of a jumping off point. And I had been doing a series of uh, books and or shall I say this books of very small editions working and, uh, and with this particular one with my grandfather, I was very much interested in using the old drawings that they used to do, of course, on vellum, uh, actually, and also on uh, on canvas, or that was done with a, on uh, architectural drafting linen, very fine linen, and all, of course, by hand. And so I went around to uh, archives and so on, and I uh, found that there were a number of uh, drawings. Actually, my father had started an archive in Milwaukee at the... Uh, actually started the ar- the architectural archive in Milwaukee. And so may so that- I uh, need to interrupt the professor. You you mentioned that you this is naturally go to my second question. Yeah. And uh, the uh, your grandfather and uh, was a craftsman. Yeah. And uh, you I remember you mentioned your father was an architect. Yes. Is that correct? That's and correct. then I think it's now it explains everything. Now it explains why you become an artist and process, professor of art. Or oh, maybe this oversimplified, but uh, it was a family background in art and arts and crafts, and uh, had a significant impact in your early career choice. And and how early did you know you want to become an artist? Uh, I I didn't know that I wanted to become an artist for a very long time. Mm. Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I went off to graduate school or, well, to, I mean, excuse me, to undergraduate school. I was a terrible student in high school. I was graduating in the 34th percentile of my graduating high school class. Then, then not too bad. Oh, Professor, where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Okay. And uh, where did you grow up? D.C. for the 1942. And uh, so he was stationed in, in uh, Washington, D.C. when I was born. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, we moved to, uh, they, he was then went to Texas and then they moved to Milwaukee. And uh, I lived with, well, my mom and my brother were in the house that belonged to my grandmother who had, you know, now my father lived there. So when he was gone, we were there during the army or during the military service in the in World War Two. Uh, but I always, you know, was, you know, my brother and I drew all the time. We'd get up in the morning and spend uh, hours, you know, sort of drawing things. My brother was a very had a much better wrist than I did, meaning that he was, you know, sort of very accurate. I, you know, sort of had a tent there. And I also began to model things in clay, uh, you know, essentially making clay just some uh, dirt in the backyard. And using wet clay on a wire armature. The problem is, is that it would dry up and so on. So I'd make another one and another one and another one. I, I liked it very much. I was always interested in making things and sort of uh, building things. There was an old uh, foot treadle lathe in the basement uh, that belonged to my grandfather that mm-hmm. I uh, started to use and learned how to use. 
and I learned to uh, turn uh, brass into objects. And my uh, objects at the time, because I was interested in history, particularly military history, the sort of cannons on, on British war ships. And so I would make models of those. Um, I would make working models of those. And uh, so from that point on, it was a matter of realizing that my interest had to do with history, had to do with literature, um, and had to do with the nature of how we come to understand or how we come to experience uh, in, in real life, uh, the things that we, we read about or the things that we've heard about. Uh, you know, the idea that uh, learning how to use this lathe was totally done on my own. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I didn't kill myself. Yeah, uh, you, 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 oh, may I, I uh, interrupt? Because you already yeah. answered my next question. Oh. The next question is to describe, please describe your artistic style and the themes that inspire your work. You answered that question perfectly. Okay. But I do want to uh, just uh, uh, fit in this question right here, because we are talking about your art right already, that yeah. you work with, uh, in my view, I, I'm, a, I'm an art critic and art historian by training, so I, I like oh. your artwork a lot. And I, I think you work with a variety of media. And... Uh, be it photography and painting and drawing and uh, installation, uh, which medium and you prefer to work with, and uh, how do the the choice of a medium uh, contribute to the message you want to convey through your artwork? Well. I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that when I'm thinking about something, this, for example, this book that I did about my grandfather's architecture, mm -hmm. I had really no idea of how to do it. I mean, in, in a sense, what I mean by that is it, it evolved, it comes to life as you begin to think about it. And so when I'm... Working on anything, the project I'm working on pushes itself as an idea, as a simple what if. And I've always been interested in what if I did this? What would this look like? What if I did that? What if I did this? And if I did it in this, what, it, what, what would it look like? There was a wonderful piece uh, that, uh, that um, uh, Klaus Oldenburg did on a piece that he was doing. He made a model in uh, you know, wood. He made it in metal. He made it in you know, a whole bunch of stuff. He also made it in, in uh, smoked salmon you know, just to see something about texture and so on. So I've always been interested in, uh, you know, sort of the material in some way has a voice in, in, the, in the thing. And so with my grandfather, that book that I was doing with him, on him or on that work, had to be used uh, with architectural drafting cloth. But where to find antique drafting cloth? And I so it spent a long time trying to find it. When I finally did, was horrible to work with in the means that were available to me now. It took an enormous amount of effort and you know sort of work to clean it and do all this. But it was the only choice I had to make because I wanted that. So that was the sort of pivotal piece once I started that. So most of the things that I work on, whether it's installations or whether it's photographs or whether it's you know any whatever it is, it has a great deal to do with it has to have something uh, it, uh, that connects with the idea. Perfect. My Perfect. overall thinking, just, I just wanted to say this, my overall thinking has to do with a, some, some element of atmosphere and an element of darkness or of shadow, mm -hmm. uh, something which is evocative. And so the materials by that means are evocative. Stones, mm -hmm. for example, are evoke particular sort of traditions of burial or traditions of various things that have to do perhaps with my grandfather's stone cutting. Uh, I was never stoned also, another one, the idea that something is weighty, casting in iron or casting in some other material. I never have chosen a material as the only one. So that's why there is the installation, there's the photographs, there's all, sometimes they're all combined together. Excellent. And I found your artwork is hard to define and uh, 
I, please take that as a compliment because the greatness is very very hard to define, and the the best artists always mm. almost always have uh, multiple identities, and it, it's difficult to define mm -hmm. in a particular category or mm -hmm. uh, uh, fit in a particular label. But my I, I'm a, out of a curiosity that. You are uh, uh, you studied art uh, in in college and graduate school as well, and uh, it, looking back in the history, uh, are there particular artists uh, and art movement have a more influential uh, impact on your art practice and your art journey than others? Mm -hmm. uh, what are your favorite artists and art movement? Uh, well, I love surrealism. I love Dadaism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, I, I'm very. I've always been very interested in modernism as an idea. I never thought of modernism as a as a thing. It's a way that you know, sort of. It's a. It's the notion of a continual change. And so I evolved essentially from a figurative artist. I still, in many ways, think of myself as a figurative artist. Because what I'm interested in is if you walk or by a person or by a human being. So if you walk into a house or an apartment or whatever, it has a kind of reference. And in many ways, that reference is there by its smell, its light, its, its uh, uh, lack of light, its uh, scale, all these things. And, you know, sort of uh, I grew up in a house that was designed by my grandfather. It had an attic. It had a big attic. It had a living space, had a bedroom, you know, floor room, uh, area and had a, a basement with a, an old, uh, you know, sort of this was he built it. When I lived there uh, when I grew up. It was built in 1906. It originally had uh, gas lighting as well as electricity. He was a, somewhat of an inventor. He had built a. Uh, dark room in there so I screwed around with all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. very often very dangerous things I started the house on fire particularly um, working with uh, a hot uh, hot wax I mean fortunately the house didn't catch on fire but you know the room did um, I set curtains on fire uh, all kinds of things I've always been interested in you know sort of <sighs> trial and error Yep, wonderful. We are we have a few minutes left, but I do have a couple more questions. Sure. And uh, the question one is, and you have a, a long and successful career in art and being a recognized artist nationally and internationally, and also a professor of art, tiny professor of art at uh, the U of M. And yeah. uh, not all the artists will be I would say uh, lucky, so to speak, to uh, have such a, a great career. And what advice you would give to aspiring uh, young artists who want to make art uh, of their life and in the career? And what, what advice you would give them? Keep an open mind and uh, be curious, always curious. Keep your eyes open. Uh, also, it, it takes a while to figure out what it is that you want. It's mm -hmm. more important to know what you don't want. I knew what I didn't want, but I never, you know, it was hard to know what I wanted. And so all of that is one of those things. When I was teaching, um, I would always, you know, sort of uh, ask somebody, well, why did you go to this movie and not that movie? Or why did you go to a movie and not a play? Or why did you dot, 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 dot. And, you know, sort of the idea that you think about these things, it's not a strategy. It's just, it's nice to wonder backwards and say, I wonder why I did that. Mm. I wonder what that was about. That was essentially the basis of my teaching strategy. And oh, so wonderful. that's one of the things that I, I suggested to people when they finish school, if they're going to graduate school, go to a different school than the one you went to for undergraduate school. Try a different space. Try a different place. Get mm. new information. Splendid. And now to, to a quick follow-up. That uh, that was wonderful advice you give to the uh, young artist. But uh, what advice you would give to a younger self, you yourself, if time travel permitted, you could travel back to your early twenties. And what advice you would give to yourself? Don't be so afraid. And it right. took me a long, long time to get over my insecurities. You had insecurities. That's a surprise. <laughs> you are one of the most courageous artists I have met. Well, thank you very much. And You're last welcome. 
last question, but not the least question. And you, you have a very high level of intellectual curiosity. You, uh, you mentioned that during the, the show, it open-minded. And uh, I just want to have an open-ended question. What are a particular recommendation, something you enjoy at the moment, books, movie, uh, a drama, a documentary, uh, you want to recommend it to our audience? Oh, um, well, I read um, uh, Simon Shama's uh, The uh, uh, Landscape of Memory. The Landscape of the Memory. Landscape of Memory. Mm. It's, it's a wonderful book. I recommend it highly. It's a, it's a nonfiction? Nonfiction. Written oh. by Simon Shama, who is a uh, historian. Hmm. And that's because we have like one minute left. I, I You mentioned the book of uh, about memory. I yeah. do want to ask you about this. Mm -hmm. And do you think our memory will continue to exist? And and can, can memory be past? Can memory be immortal? Can memory be passed from one generation to another generation? And can memory can be solidified in the form of art or form of a literature? I think it can. I mean, it certainly has so far. Um, you know, the technology changes so fast that uh, things that I've done on uh, videotape years ago are, you know, pretty much, you know, can't, nobody has any way to see them anymore. But mm -hmm. you can still buy a book or you can still do a variety of other things. So, you know, I, I think that the memory and history evolve largely through looking at uh, that, looking at art and the things that have been done. Art and architecture are critical, and it's foolish to think that uh, that uh, we live primarily only on and in, in one in one time. We live for a very long time. I mean, throughout history. Wonderful, splendid. Thank you so much. Art make us immortal. And thank you, Professor, being an artist and being an art educator. That's uh, we're lucky to have you in Minnesota. Thank you so much for 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 your time, and I look forward to your next art exhibition. And uh, have a wonderful uh, day, Professor. Well, you too. I thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. It's a lot of fun. Same here. Aloha. Right. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.